And so good morning, Unity Center of Peace. Uh, again, I hope you're warm and cozy on this cold and beautiful snowy day. But let's get ready because today we are embarking on our five-part talk series based on the five principles. So let's begin with, well, let me ask you a question. Um, has anyone ever asked you, oh, so you, you know, your unity, uh, what is it that unity believes? Well, what are the major tenets in unity? And you stood there kind of like, ah, uh, well, <laughs> well, it's because unity is, it has no dogma, it has no set rules, which is what we love about it, right? But it just makes it more difficult to pin down, more difficult to uh, to explain. But thanks to the Fillmore's great granddaughter, Connie Fillmore, we have something now with which we can communicate what unity is about in an understandable way to others. And I think, you know, even for us, uh, you know, we, we very often need something simple and concrete to wrap our heads around some pretty abstract concepts, right? So uh, it's interesting that neither Charles nor Myrtle Fillmore uh, wrote down any like <clears throat> specific principles, you know, set any defined principles. Of course, they knew about them. It's all in the writings, but they um, they just didn't uh, di they didn't define anything concrete in that kind of way. It wasn't until a century later that Connie Fillmore. Uh, defined these five principles. And she did so only because she was asked to, uh, to explain Unity's teachings in, uh, for an article that they were writing for um, Daily Word. So it's interesting that, you know, it took so long, right? <laughs> One wonders if Unity would have been more popular from the start had they, you know, started with, with that. Because again, you know, we, in order to really grasp it, sometimes we need some specific, concrete examples. So that's the blessing of this, and that's what we're, we're all about today. And not only uh, does this give us a way to explain a unity principles, but even for us, you know, we, we just, we often need to have this um, to, to be able to explain it to others, to be able to experience it. And the more we dive into these five principles, the deeper we dive into our understanding and our experience of the divine. And the more we truly understand our power as co-creator and we learn to use it. So there are many different <clears throat> ways to uh, explain these five principles, and depending upon where you look, you can find different wordings, different versions. Even uh, the children, for the, for the YFM, Children's Church, has um, a version, a very simple version of these five, five principles. But I really like the version that uh, Ellen Devonport shares in her book, The Five Principles. Um, I just find them to be uh, clear, easy to understand. Um, they're, they're grounded in, in more universal spiritual truths. And so this is the book that we're going to be using for the most part over the next five weeks. Uh, so if you want to follow along, um, you know, I, I highly encourage you. And in addition to these uh, five weeks of this talk series, Coinciding that, we have book study groups. We have three book study groups on different days with different leaders at different times so you can find one, <coughs> excuse me, that fits into your schedule. So, no excuse there. <laughs> excuse me. All right, so let's, let's dive in. <coughs> so, here's the thing. We're talking about principle. Um, so I think it's important to really agree on what principle is. Principle is 
universal laws. They're universal laws. They're, they work the same. They're constant. They work for everyone the same way, regardless of whether you believe in them or not. So the law of gravity, the law of aerodynamics, uh, the law of cause and effect, the law of motion, you know, gravity's going to work for you, just like it works for everyone else. Unless, of course, you're in outer space, then I'm sure there's gravity there. It just works in a different way. <laughs> but it works regardless of whether you believe it or not. <coughs> the same is true for spiritual principles. They're a constant, right? They work the same way for everyone, regardless of whether you believe them or not. And that's where the hitch comes in. Because here's the thing, most people don't know how these principles work. They don't know how to work them, and so they live their lives by default. You know, they don't know that they have a direct connection with the divine. And so they feel that they're separate from source, separate from the whole. They don't know that the universe responds to their thinking. And so they feel that they're just a victim of the winds of fate. And that becomes their experience. And maybe that was true for you, too, before you found unity. I know it was true for me before I found new thought. You know? And here's the thing. These, again, they're universal principles. So they don't belong exclusively to unity. You can actually find them in the, the, the core of some of the more mystical aspects of many faiths. It's just that I find that unity makes them clear, separates out all the baggage, you know, puts them front and center, and, puts, and presents them in a way that you can use them, that you can apply them to your life. That's what, you know, the whole idea of practical spirituality is all about. Right? All right, so here we go. Principle one, God is all. God is all there is. Another way to say this is God is absolute good everywhere present. Absolute good everywhere present. Now, that's a different way of understanding God. Certainly different than the traditional Judeo-Christian way of understanding God as a, a being out there somewhere watching us, <clears throat> judging us, right? Answering some people's prayers and not others, you know, sussing out whether we're worthy or not. And uh, whose identity, by the way, is male. That, that old idea. So this is a kind of a different concept. As, as Ellen Devonport says in her book, that is the God of our childhood. And that's okay. Maybe that, you know, as children, maybe that's the only way that we could kind of understand it. But now that we're grown up, time for a grown-up understanding of God, right? One, <coughs> one that reflects our evolving consciousness. Uh, so this is um, the idea that rather than seeing God <coughs> as an entity, an entity which, by the way, we create in our own image and likeness, we want to open to the idea of God as an essence, as the essence of all, as the, the Tao or the infinite reality or uh, the cosmic birther of all form and experience is kind of a Vedic way of understanding it. <clears throat> the ultimate reality, the ground of being, the, um, so this, this more expansive idea of an essence. So rather than being, it is beingness. It is beingness. <clears throat> beingness that is both transcendent and imminent. The, the grown-up understanding of God has both of these elements, <clears throat> the transcendent and the imminent. <clears throat> so transcendent, meaning that it is above and beyond all form and experience, above and beyond the relative world of effect, 
above and beyond our own limited understanding of it. It is absolute, <clears throat> universal, omnipotent. And imminent being that it is <clears throat> a present reality, that it is here and now within everything and within every body, within us. It is all pervasive. It is personal. <clears throat> so this idea, this grown-up idea of understanding God has both of these uh, elements. It's not one or the other. And we can experience the transcendent nature. So this imminent nature of God, is it means that it is personal to us it is within us and guiding us. And <clears throat> we can, you know, we can uh, use this. We can feel that we're guided. We'll talk more about this next week when we go into week two, principle two. But the transcendent nature of God, you may have experienced it in deep meditation, you know, where you, if you've ever had a meditation where you feel that you've gone beyond your body, beyond <clears throat> the here and now, beyond space and time, and had that really transcendent experience, that's it. Maybe you've had that in prayer where you've, you know, a heartfelt prayer. Maybe you've had it where you were viewing this expansive, awesome vista like <clears throat> the Grand Canyon or the sky. You know, or, you know, Big Sky, if you've ever been out to Big Sky country and just been, it's really awesome. Or away from the city where, you know, away from the city lights and you look up to the night sky and you see the billions of stars. Maybe you've had that transcendent experience in that moment. And maybe that's even where, you know, the original idea of God being up in the sky, maybe that's where that came from. Yeah. <laughs> Well, God is the sky, but God is also the trees and the rocks and in the face of your neighbor. So it is all pervasive, everywhere present. We can also describe God as non-dual reality. It's this non-dual, it's the view that there is no other that the, the separation between you and I has been transcended, that there is nothing missing. There is no, uh, no thing where God is not. In fact, uh, my grandmother, who I found out later was a Christian science practitioner, used to say, there is no spot where God is not. And I've used that, like, through my life, in my prayer work, um, I just have a relation to that. You, you know, you want to use whatever it is that shifts your consciousness to a grander understanding of spirit, right? So whatever works for you, use it. Uh, we can also understand God as a cosmos of intelligence. A cosmos of intelligence that is boundless, endless. Can you even imagine where the universe ends or where it begins? And what would be on the other side of that, right? It is, it is eternal, limitless. In fact, they're saying that, um, that the universe in which we live is only one of many, that we live in a multiverse. I mean, can you just even, I mean, talk about mind-blowing. <clears throat> of course, that's the idea that has sparked many creative writers uh, and movie producers for, <laughs> for a lot of science fiction movies and superhero movies, the idea of a multiverse. What are those people doing over there in a parallel universe that look like us? It's interesting to think about. But what we know is that it is eternal, right? It is eternal. And it looks like things wither and die. It, even suns, S-U-N-S, have a lifespan, but nothing really disappears. It just changes form. It's the same energy. It's a force of energy. And that force of energy is not only intelligent, but it is love. It is love. In fact, what I often say to myself, my, my, an affirmation for myself, is that 
It is the love intelligence in which I live, move, and have my being. We can maybe say that together. It is a love intelligence in which I live, move, and have my being. That really helps me to connect with it. Hopefully it does for you too. <clears throat> okay, so let's say that we accept this, that this is our premise. This is our foundation. This is our basis. And maybe we even share this idea with others. So... Um, the next question that people often ask is, okay, so God is all there is. God is absolute good everywhere present. What about evil? You know, where is that? How does that fit in? And truly, you know, I mean, sometimes there are some things, some people, some experiences that we might label as evil. You know, and sometimes if we're experiencing them, we might wonder where God is in that experience. A natural disaster that kills lots of people. Or uh, the coronavirus, right? That has killed millions of people. Or global warming. Or um, <clears throat> terrorists. 9-11. The Holocaust. Where is God in that, we might ask? And so, it, with the exception of natural disasters, what I have just mentioned, are those are created, they're human created, right? You could trace it back and know even, you know, global warming. Human created. So we'll talk in the next few weeks about our nature, our divine nature, and the nature of our co-creative ability, you know, free will. So there is no set answer, um, official, you know, what evil is in unity. But I really like the ideas that um, Ellen Devonport shares in her book about this. They're just possibilities that she is exploring. And if you have the book right now, you can follow along. It's on page 26. And we'll take a look at that. All right, so here's her first idea. Is humans were created with free will. And we make mistakes. Again, we're going to talk more about this in the next coming weeks. The word sin originally meant missing the mark. It was an archery term. It meant missing the mark. She says, some miss it by miles. <laughs> yeah, some miss it by miles. Uh, her second point is good and evil are simply labels that humans give to events based on our opinions at the time. What first appears to be a tragedy may turn out to be a blessing. It was a devastating underwater volcano that gave rise to the Hawaiian Islands. <clears throat> Given enough time, you know. Uh, her third point is the human species is immature. The Aramaic word, and by the way, Aramaic is the language that Jesus spoke, and that's the language that the, the, uh, where he lived, that people spoke that wasn't, the Bible wasn't written in Aramaic ever. Uh, it was, you know, written later and translated and retranslated, but the language he spoke was Aramaic. And the word that became evil in the Bible is bisha, which means immature or unripe. Hence, the biblical reference to evil fruit. It was unripe. We as humans are immature or unripe, not yet living from divine consciousness. That's a powerful point. The next idea is we can't see the big picture. Events have meaning we do not understand, although later we might see the gifts that were brought to us through the most difficult times in our lives. And I'm sure you can all share an example in your own life of that. <clears throat> we are creating our world through consciousness, which is principle three that we'll go over in week three, which most people do not realize, much less know how to handle, she says. Our every thought, feeling, and word sets up a response from the universe but we have only a glimmer of understanding how to create our experience deliberately. 
well, we're going to learn this, right? <laughs> we're going to learn this, how to create deliberately in the next five weeks. Uh, and then she says, what we call evil is an impression of mass consciousness. And I might call that the collective unconscious. You know, you may have heard that term. We all contribute to it through our angry and violent thoughts, the energetic vibrations we pour into the one mind. The energy inevitably expresses somewhere, just as an erupting volcano releases heat from the earth. And her last idea is we are balancing the events of a past life, sometimes called karma. This is not so much punishment or reward as reconciling accounts and offering an opportunity to experience life from all sides, which I think is a beautiful way of understanding karma, which I, I don't always think is right, but I, I like the way she puts it there. I can kind of open to that idea. So again, these are possibilities for you to kind of sit with and meditate on and see what your own divine wisdom, um, what you, you know, resonate with. And here's another question that we can ask, and not many people do. And that, and more people should. And that's the question of why is there so much good in the world? Why is there so much abundance? Why is there so much love and joy? The amount of love and joy that I can experience is limitless. Why is that? Why do clouds have silver linings? Why is there always a blessing in something I once thought was bad? Those are questions that we can begin to think about, and that's going to take us in a completely different understanding. So get together in your book study groups and discuss these ideas, discuss these principles, meditate on them, um, and then come back next Sunday, and uh, we, will, we will begin to build on what the foundation today. All right. Namaste.